Since that blessed night in the manger, she watched her baby grow. Seemed like yesterday he was in her arms. Where did the time go? He learned his father's trade, and she marveled at it all. Sweat dropped from the little carpenter. As he made the timbers fall, she can hear them drive the nails upon the hillside, and she prays that his spirit will not fail. She watches as a young man undertakes the Father's will, as she stands and listens. To the driving nails in the streets of Jerusalem, a child can disappear. She was frantic as she looked for him until she began to hear hammers up at the temple. She called him as she ran. Surprised, she found him teaching like no ordinary man. She can hear them driving nails upon the hillside, and she prays that his spirit will not fail. She watches as a young man undertakes his father's will. As she stands and listens to the driving nails, darkness covered all the land in the middle of the day. She began to tremble as the earth began to quake. Hammers, nails, and timbers of the carpenter's trade made the sound that pierced her soul as the cross was being raised. She can hear them driving nails upon the hillside, and she prays that His Spirit will not fail. As a young man undertakes the Father's will, and she stands and listens to the driving nails, as she cries and listens to those driving nails. Good morning and welcome to Mountaintop Cowboy Church. Week after week, we come to you uh, on the uh, YouTube channel and we come to you from our Facebook page. And now for the past two Sundays, we've been meeting back in church and what a delight last Sunday was to have so many people come out and even though every other row was closed off and it was still a little distant, my, how we enjoyed worshiping together. We look forward to ministering to you in the coming weeks. Folks, this is all going to change. I promise you, just be patient and wait. It's all going to change. This is not sustainable, uh, what the program that we're on right now. They're not going to keep everybody at home until every germ in the world has passed. This has actually now become no longer about a virus. It is about two philosophical, ideological ideas that are opposing one another. The governor of California is demanding that all churches remain locked down while beer joints and taverns and bars are going to be able to open up. I understand that there are two distinct philosophies at work here. 
One says, in a bureaucratic, autocratic sense, I am a governor. I can autocratically say to you, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. There's another huge movement swelling across the country, though, that is saying we've had enough and we've heard enough. There are civil liberties. In fact, I think we're in a brand new uh, civil revolution, a civil rights movement, if you would, because uh, defenders are now having to go to uh, court for pastors all over the country. There are more than 15 different pastors right now that have been served. Summons are been found in jail and having to get all the lawyers helping them just because of uh, the, the state saying, no, you can't do this. So it is two distinct ideological ideas. One is we have civil, civil liberties that were given to us under the Constitution from the founding fathers who hit the shores on Plymouth Rock saying, we hit this shore, we dig deeply for religious freedom. And anyone who discounts what believers can do once they get riled up, better watch out. We're in Exodus chapter 14 today. I want to give you a couple of ideas about what to do when you don't know what to do. Where to go when you've got nowhere to go. When there's no way out but up. Title this anything you want, but looking at it from Moses' perspective and the children of Israel's perspective of what God is attempting to do. I think one thing that we've been able to do for the last 50 or 60 days is say, what is God saying to me? What is his Holy Spirit leading me to do? I was talking to a bunch of Bible college students years ago and they asked me, how did you get into so many foreign mission projects and, and worked in so many countries? My answer was, I got kicked into it. Every time you come to a place that you don't know what to do or where he's going to send you or why he's leading you there, God seems to give you a little kick in the seat of the pants and you move forward. We're going to examine that today in uh, Exodus chapter 14. If you grab your Bible, verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, I love this phrase, you will see again no more forever. What a powerful statement. The Egyptians that you see today, look in your rearview mirror. This is the last time when God's had enough. The first word I want to give you today is to stand still. Verse 13 and verse 14, stand still. In order for God to work in our lives, oftentimes we've just got to get quiet. We are always busy with something and I am the world's worst. If I'm not doing 10 to 15 things at, at one time, I don't even like to take a shower simply because I can only do that one thing. So while I'm showering, I'm thinking about messages or calls that I need to make. Uh, or things that I need to write, or things that I should be doing. I've always been that way. When I was a little little bitty boy, uh, my mama uh, would lose me in stores. Literally every store we went in, she would lose me. I've always been a wanderer, an adventurer, what's around the next corner kind of guy. And this was before they put the long dog leashes on kids to, to hold them in. So my mama hated to take me to the store because I was gone. When I was five years old, I was arrested by the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department. The reason I was arrested was I was chasing the good humor ice cream man who came by our house. Mama gave me a nickel. I tried to catch him. I missed him on block one, missed him on block two, cut across a third block, missed him on block three. By block seven or eight, I was totally out of my neighborhood. I was finally picked up by the LAPD. They said, what's your name? I said, Bobby, where do you live? And I said, in L.A., but the whole concept of how I see things is keep adventuring, keep looking, never stop. Always see what's over that next rise. But in order for God to work for us, many times we need to get still. I love the psalmist who said, be still and know. Not be still and do, not be still and try, be still and know. The word ginosko in the Greek comes uh, from an understanding that I have come to reason this out. I've come to understand, ginosko. I now have this knowledge and it's turned into wisdom. Be still and know. 
To know means the more I listen to God, the more that I am still, the more I understand that God is working in my life, even when I can't see it, even when I'm discouraged, depressed, even when I'm disgusted with life, even when crazy politicians come out with ridiculous things to say and attempt to make us believe. Wait a minute. Be still and know. And in verse 13, Moses instructs Israel to get still. They've come quickly with unleavened bread and everything they could put on their donkeys and their packs and their carts. And now they're at a place they've never been before, a place by which if God does not do something, they won't make it. And that's what desperation is, coming to a place that if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. And so Moses says to them, don't be afraid. Stand still. The reason they're afraid is they kept looking in the rearview mirror, and here comes the Egyptians. More than 600 chariots, each chariot having a captain and a driver. There's 1,200 men coming at them, plus an army that is valued at about 10,000. So thousands of warriors are behind you. As they look in the rearview mirror, they say, we, we brought no weapons. We have no army. Therefore, we're going to get taken over. In fact, that's what they've already said to Moses. Moses, would to God you'd have left us alone back there where we could have served Egypt, eat the leeks and the garlics when we wanted to. Yes, we were slaves. Yes, we had no civil liberties. Yes, we had no government system. Yes, we had, we had uh, no educational programs for our children. We had nothing, but at least we got three squares a day. But that's what happens to everyone who is in captivity. Those who are in captivity of their sin lose direction of where they are because sin will always take you farther than you want to go and it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And all of a sudden, this stuff looks pretty good and you learn to survive on the scraps. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Now, stand still. The ability to stand still. One of the most basic things that we teach our children is how to be still. I love to study Indian culture, Native Americans, and the Apache had a way because they were always running, always hiding. They had a way to teach their babies not to cry, to be completely still because of the enemy who would be coming and listening for the sounds of a crying baby. Be still and know. Be still and wait. One of the things in training a dog or a horse or any pet is to learn to teach them to be still. If they can calm themselves, then they can hear you. And that's all that God is saying through Moses. Don't be afraid. Stand still. Now, there is a principle here about every one of us because he says that salvation is coming. Stand still and see the salvation of God. It is identical to the salvation in the New Testament. The Old Testament believers came and looked before the cross, but they're saved by faith. We look behind at the cross that was behind us, and by faith we come through the cross to the forgiveness of our sins, and we become believers in Jesus Christ. We become joint heirs with him, companions of the Lord, disciples of the Lord through his salvation. So he says, stand still so that you can see the salvation of God. Now here's how it's going to happen. He will accomplish for you today. What? Your salvation. Your salvation is going to be accomplished not by your works, not by your good skill, not by your resources, but your salvation will come about because of God doing it for you. You see the parallel? Be still and you will see the salvation of God, how that he will accomplish that in you. Everything that God desires to accomplish in you, he is going to get done. He is sovereign in his grace over you. He is sovereign in his ability to move you back and forward. And many of us are still caught and captured with the, the idea of the concept of this virus has America shut down. No, fear now has America shut down. There will, there will have to come some emotional, psychological release or switch by which we get over this fear and we stop running from one another and we begin to do the things that God is wanting to accomplish in our lives. Now, when he says stand still and see what he will accomplish in your life, it means turn loose. 
Don't try to swim the Red Sea because you're not going to make it. Don't try to build rafts because you're never going to get them across. Stand still. That's a, a, an element and a level of trust that is seldom seen. We have to stand still and wait for him to accomplish what he will accomplish in you. Now, phrase two. First, he tells us, I want you to stand still. Next, he says in verse 15, uh, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Oh, stand still until you, you see that God is working in your life. Now, I want you to go forward. It's time to move. When I was in basic training in the Army, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, every soldier has to learn to march. And you do it in cadence. Count cadence. Hop, two, three, four. Hop, two, three, four. Everyone must move to that one cadence. You had a good home when you left. You're right. You want to go back, but you can't. You're right. Sound off. One, two, once more. Three, four. Bring it on down. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Everyone must move on that order or you don't have an army. You have chaos. Go forward, but you're going to go forward together and you're going to go when I tell you to go. The, the, you must reach a point in your spiritual life that you're no longer just standing still, but now it's time to move forward. America is at a time where we've got to move forward. If we don't pull the switch on an economy, we'll have no economy, and that's what many of the politicians are desiring. They want this thing shut down because they believe that their $3 trillion stimulus bill will save the country. Well, it would if we had $3 trillion, but we don't. And it would if everyone would filter that money down to where it needs to go, but it won't. Already in the new stimulus package, Speaker Pelosi has added much garbage uh, that has nothing to do with people who are not making a living right now. We don't trust when they say move forward. And so when God says move forward, because I've had you standing still until you can realize and see the salvation of God is coming. Now, let's go forward. Let's do this thing. So in verse 15, why are you crying? Why do you keep whining? He says to Moses, tell the people, go forward. Here's the problem with that. There's nowhere to go. Forward is the Red Sea. Backward is the army of Egypt. Surrounding them are the high walls of Pahasron. There's nowhere to go. The Gulf of Aqaba is on one side. The Suez Canal that we know of, the Suez, is on the other. Where are we going to go? By faith. We move forward by faith. Anything in your life that does not consist of faith or does not generate from faith is not pleasing to God. Now, I do a lot of things that are not by faith. I do them by action. If I have money in my billfold, I, I will spend up to the amount of the money I have in that billfold because then I have another resource called the card. And that works until Miss Jan sees what I spent on the card and then we have another problem. When he says go forward, it is by faith. Not on what you're going to carry with you. Not on what your skill level is. If Even if you're an Olympic swimmer, you're not going to make it through the Red Sea. Go forward by faith. That's how we go forward. So he says, stop your whining, stop the crying, tell the children of Israel to go forward. Remember, in cadence. They were divided into five major groups through this, through this march, and now he's saying it's time to go forward. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm suggesting to, to you today, it is time the American church gets back up and goes forward. It's time for her pastors to quit whining about church and doing it on the parking lot or doing it on Facebook or YouTube on little small cameras. It's time for us to realize we go forward by faith. We go forward when the Spirit of God says, let's move. I don't care where we're going to meet, how often we're going to meet, as long as we're going forward by faith and not backward. So stop your whining, he says. Tell the children of Israel, go forward. Now we move to verse 16 the next set of phrases of marching orders. First, stand still. See the salvation. Once you see that God is accomplishing things in your life, move forward. And you move forward in faith. Verse 16, 
But lift up your rod, Moses, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Here's the marching order. It's time to go through the Red Sea. Now, this is still a future tense verb here. Moses, I am giving you the command. You shall take it to the people, and this is what you will say. It's time for us to go forward. Now, as we move forward, we're going to go through the Red Sea. What? We're going to go, let's build a bridge. Let's create a canal. Let's do something that makes sense here, Moses. We can't go through the middle of the Red Sea. So, word three, got to go through. It's future tense. They're not doing it now, but they're getting in their mind that they've got to go through something. I think that when we become desperate enough to see God work, then we're willing to walk out by faith and go through the middle of the problem. I've always found the best way through a problem is right through the middle of it. Don't dodge it. Don't stop talking about it. Go right straight through the middle of it. So the third marching order for Israel is you're going to go through the midst of the Red Sea on dry ground. Oh, such faith that requires. Peter's in the boat with the other disciples. Lord, if it's really you, what would stop me from being where you are? And Jesus said, not a thing in the world. He takes a step by faith. He looks down because he realizes that he is in an impossible situation. He can't go forward on his own. It must be by faith. I still love his adventurous spirit. I still love him grabbing both of the gunnels of the boat and jumping out, trying to get to where Jesus was. Going through your problems is where we are in this country today. It's where our families are today. Going through, right through the heart of the problem. The heart of our problem is found in verse 13, don't be afraid. America is now afraid. We have taken the largest economy in the world and turned it upside down into where uh, millions of people are now on unemployment. Going into this pandemic thing, we had the lowest unemployment probably in the history of our nation and at one of our most prosperous points or places. Now look at us. And I believe that there are, there are people in governing positions today who want us there who want the state to become the savior, who want people to look to the state for their every need. I don't want a stimulus package. Our church does not want one penny of government money. In fact, if they were knocking at the door and saying, here's $100,000 uh, for your church, we would have to say, thank you, but no thank you. We're, we have always looked to the Lord. He's the one that stands, tells us to stand still. He's the one that tells us to go forward. And it's in his resource and not in the states that we make all of our progress. And so to go through the midst means it's a problem. We're going to have to go in a, in a realm and a reality that we've never experienced before. Great faith. And so he says to them, go through, right through the middle. Go tell the people we're going to go through in the middle. Now, the backstory, verse 17 and I indeed will harden the heart of Pharaoh with the Egyptians, and they will follow them. Now, Moses, here's the deal. They're going to keep coming. The enemy will keep coming. But look at the promise in verse 13. These Egyptians who you see right now today, you will never, ever see again. And when salvation comes to a person, the enemies that they fought, the bad temper, the abuse, the language, the, the perverse sex life, the pornography, the bad thoughts, the cursing, uh, the, the, the larceny of the hands, the, the, the stealing, and all that goes in the human sin condition. Those are enemies that when he accomplishes his salvation in you, you never have to see them again. When we repent of our sin, we lay it all down. We leave it all with him. And so here's the back story. They're going to keep coming after you, but remember, they're not going to catch up to you. I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh because that's what he wants to do. I'm going to give it to him. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh in this, all over his, cho his chariots, his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. There's a biggest, there is a larger purpose in this pandemic than you being displaced. Are you paying triple amounts for bacon? 
There's a larger story going on here than just us having cheap gas and uh, $20 a pound steak. There's a much deeper story. God's going to get the honor for this if you'll just back off and let him have it. I can do without eating steak for a month or two. I can do without many things if we have to. If we are willing to give God the glory for whatever situation we're in, we can watch him work. Go through in the midst of dry ground. The Egyptians shall know I will be honored in this. And verse 19, the other portion of the backstory, he sends the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel and moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood between them. God makes a, a divisional line. He allows the children of Israel to get a little rest. And for them, he gives them light. But for the Egyptian side of it, it's utter darkness. A total fog comes over them. And that's the fog over the world today. They are in a fog. They think they have the answer to every problem. We just learned today for, through a new press conference that, well, maybe the virus does not stay on metal objects and all like we thought. Everything that they thought was right is not right. I don't blame them. They didn't know what to do. But here's the thing. They always believe that they do. They're in a fog, folks. They are in a fog. You've got to quit worrying about trusting them. And you're going to have to trust the Lord. The Egyptians are coming behind you. God sets an angel. He puts a daylight and dark between you so that you can get some rest. There's a huge cloud over them. Verse 20, so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other so that the one could not come near the other all night. Listen, when you're in the hand of God, there is no enemy that's going to touch you. When you're in the very hand of God, there's no one that's going to come after you. You stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. You move forward when you, when you hear him say, hut, teach, hut, move forward. That's when you move. You go through even on water that will become dry ground if that's where he calls you to. Now, the fourth set of phrases of movement that he cadenced out to us. Verse 22. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. And the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. Now, folks, it was this way all day long. If you saw the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner, as a little boy, I got to watch that. My mama and I sat and watched that. And the waters became this huge wall. But it was about a five-minute deal, and all Israel ran through. Folks, it would, have, it would have taken at least 24 hours for that many people to cross the Red Sea. The hand of God. The hand of God is at work. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Go forward when I tell you. Go through the mess when it's there. There's only way through a problem is to go directly through the middle of it. Now, word four, go straight through the middle of the sea. There it is. There's a course. Pick a path. Stay on it. You got to quit changing. You got to quit wobbling. You got to quit moving from this, this idea to this portion. Uh, I talked to a man recently who could not make up his mind which version of the Bible he was going to read, so he's reading all of them. And all it does is add to more confusion. Pick a path and stay on it. I, I, I hear pastors continually in their discouragement uh, lash out at their own members for not being faithful and for not giving and, and, and for not doing the things that we're called to do. And folks, that's, that's not going to help. You've got to pick a path, stay on it, encourage the people to stand still and see God work, to go forward when he says, to go through the problems when they're there, and then to go straight through the middle of the sea. You pick a path and stay on it. And the Egyptians pursued after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen, and you know the rest of the story. Now, where are you? Are you standing still listening for God? Or are you moving forward? Uh, have you reached a point where you're going through the, the heart, the middle of your problems? Or are you still overlooking them? Are you still uh, dodging them? Are you still saying, if I don't look, it will go away? If I pay no attention to it, surely it will go away? Because it's not going to. If you don't handle the difficult things first, you'll never handle the difficult things. I believe that we're to go straight through the middle of the sea by faith wherever he leads us. Pick a path and stay on it. I appreciate the great value of a beating heart because without the beating heart, I'm not alive to do anything else. So we have to have a beating heart. The church has a beating heart. We're alive, but we're a little confused. Some of us are still standing still. Some of us are still in fear. Some of us are moving forward 
but not really in God's timing or in his voice. We're just moving. Some of us are willing to go through. And, and some of us see a clear path and we're going to take it straight through the middle of the sea. What to do when you don't know what to do? Move, stand still, go through, go straight through the middle of your crisis. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? I want to speak one minute now to everyone who's listening to me who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to stand still. Your goodness, all of your good works, all of your family lineage, your name, your papa, being a preacher or anything else will not bring you into the kingdom. Repentance of your sin will bring you into the kingdom. Telling God that you're sorry for all this baggage that you have brought to him. Asking him to swap all the garbage and baggage that you're bringing for his righteousness. And he puts that righteousness on you like a gown. And he calls you close. And he calls you friend, redeemed, church member, whatever you want to call it, forgiven. If you don't know that pardon of Jesus Christ, you do need to pray, but you also need to repent. You got to change your direction. You got to change your ways. I'm going to tell you that if you don't change your ways, if you don't repent of your sin, the ultimate reality for you is a life of hell and torment away from the very presence of God. I encourage you this day to bow before him and to tell him that you're a sinner and to ask his precious blood that was shed upon Calvary's cross to cover you and to make you righteous. Leave the rest up to him. You'll see his salvation work in you. You'll grab a Bible and all of a sudden it's a word of life. All of a sudden it's a water that makes you never thirst again. Come to Jesus. For every one of you church members, listen, stand still. Watch for him. Move forward when you hear him speak. Go through when you're in the middle of a problem and go straight through on the path that he's chosen right through the heart of the, of the worst condition possible, the middle of the sea, and God will make a way for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. As it applied to Moses and the children of Israel, so too it applies to us in the New Testament day. Lord, many are still living in fear. Many want to go forward. Many see no clear path. Many are confused. So I pray that they will listen to you, to your Holy Spirit. I pray for our spiritual leaders. Lord, I pray that we'll, we'll get our backbone in the right position, strengthened and ready to move the army of God forward. Lord, we've got some fights to fight now. I pray that you'll give us strength, the energy of your Holy Spirit uh, to challenge the state where it must be challenged, to challenge unbelief where it must be challenged, to challenge the darkness in our own community. And we'll give you the praise and the thanks for it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast today. God bless you. This is Bob Shelton from the Mountaintop.